Yeah. Uh, I don't when you can move to the full stop here for the time being so everybody comes. So this is your this is your class. Or is this, this is a, this is um Hi, Santok. Yes, hey, Arab. Thank you. you for, thank you for doing this. Um, I think you're going to find it fun and exciting, and the students definitely will find something to be inspired about. While I try to get out of it, you will let me. Can you can you hear me okay, Sarab? I can. Okay. You want to try presenting your slides? 
I, yes, I, I, I'm going to try, and if there's any problem, then you can. Yes. Okay. No, I was just saying that I tried to get out of it, and you did not let me. So. <laughs> <laughs> You did make me work harder to just cut and paste from a number of other you know, presentations, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've done, you've done quite a few presentations, but maybe this is a little bit different from a deeply technical talk. So you've done professional talks like this as well? Uh, yes, I have. I, I've done a number of interviews that you also um, seen um, along with the, you know, the presentations and Right. You know, as you know, one thing leads to the other. Um, so, yeah, been busy with these. Yeah, these days, many of our conferences have symposia, like professional symposia, professional sessions, like uh, telling new faculty members or graduate students who are going to go into the faculty market. So, for example, uh, in October of last year, I gave a talk at one of the IEEE IS conferences called ISRI. There's a keynote but it was meant for new faculty members. So I titled my talk as how to have a terrible or a terrific life in the first three years as a faculty member. Uh, and increasingly conferences are doing that, I think to a, a good purpose. Yeah, and, and it, it gives the new faculty and the students a window into, you know, what is on the other side and, and expectations and so that they could get ready for the new, uh, you know, transformation from where are they are to uh, either faculty position uh, or uh, go to the industry. So I, exactly, I, yeah, I think those are good. Exactly. So, so, so these these uh, talks, you have them every month or every week or every week. Every week you have. Yeah. One. Okay. This is part of a class, actually. <clears throat> okay. No, I didn't know that part. I, I thought yeah. this is uh, probably just standalone. Um, but yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, I started it in spring of last year, mm -hmm. and this is the second offering of this. So this is a one credit class. Okay. And how many? How many? Um, what's the size of the class? So anywhere between forty to sixty. So it's a, it's a it's a decent size. Yeah, and there are several people who are also, you know, part of our professional master's programs and so on. So they cannot see it live. So it's recorded and then they see it offline. So this is a 500 level class, which means it's open to our undergraduate students as well as to our graduate students. And it's meant to be done asynchronously as well. You know, this is part of our new reality where people should be able to partake of it at any any time. So you, you, of course, see many of our uh, learners here synchronously, but there'll be at least as many, if not more, who will also be dialing in and seeing this asynchronously. Well, that's good. If it's a part of PMP, um, you know that I'm um, co-instructor with David Zane and, 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 and Tillman. So maybe we can uh, then probably play this one the same for that class also. Certainly, certainly. So did you want to try presenting from your slide deck? See if yes, it works. Yeah, yes, I'm going to try that. OK, let's see. And let me say share. You see my slides? Yes. And can you go to the next slide? Uh, no, hang on. Uh, just make it. Uh, Yeah, it does move. Good. It does. Okay. Yeah. So if you are ready, I will introduce you and then we'll get started. Go ahead. All right. It's my great pleasure today to um, welcome to our class, uh, Dr. Santok Badesha. Uh, I'm very proud to call him a colleague of mine now in ECE. And prior to that, he was a corporate fellow and a manager of open innovation at Xerox Corp. And he has just an amazing number of patents. He has uh, jaw-dropping 26 issued US patents and 55 other patents which are in different stages of processing. Uh, in terms of uh, technical work, 
he's he's really very well known for this digital printing on demand, uh, which Xerox has really productized and become quite famous for. And uh, you as undergrads or uh, graduate students may not know that the highest distinction an engineer can get in this country is to become a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, Santok became, was elected to this National Academy of Engineering in 2021. And uh, his citation read for developing materials, enabling the broad use of laser printing and the creation of color laser printing. And not surprisingly, he's also uh, a member of the National Academy of Inventors. So um, it's fantastic that we're going to get to hear from him, his professional life story and, and all these great discoveries that he's really been in the middle of, in the forefront of in several of these cases of leading. So with that, Santok, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Arab. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And um, what I've done is, um, you know, cut and paste um, the slides or uh, pieces of some of the slides which I have presented over the years at different forums and try to convey uh, key messages from, you know, how far I have come from, you know, uh, where I was. Um, and lessons learned from each one of those transitions uh, from back home to uh, across the ponds to uh, another pond uh, and, and um, going through some of, some of the ups and downs, but keeping a focus on delivery um, um, so that it benefits me personally, uh, professionally, but at the same time, benefits the organizations I've been involved with, some of them I've been working with, uh, and the like. Um, so I, I have personally called this as my journey. Um, so, um, and, and, and then you see, um, the Xerox logo and Purdue University logo. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. And, and, and now, um, as Saurabh mentioned, I'm a, um, I joined Purdue later last year uh, as a distinguished professor in the electrical and computer engineering, which is a part of the College of Engineering. And then uh, I'm still associated part of my time uh, with Xerox. Um, because that's what the system allows to spend one day a week uh, independent consulting. And that's what I'm doing um, at Xerox. Uh, so two hats, that's the bottom line. Uh, one of the bigger hat, uh, you know, full-time uh, uh, at Purdue, um, and, but also still involved with Xerox Corporation. My title stays same. I'm in my old office. I'm using Xerox computer. Um, which is pretty unique and rare in army corporations. Once you retire, they won't let you um, be a part of it, at least for um, you know, a year or so. In any case, uh, if, I, if I had more time, I probably would have put more logos here uh, showing um, from back, back home to England to you know, part of the US and then to here in Rochester, then to Purdue. Um, but I can do that later on. So um, that's that's the little little background. And um, the way I'm going to try to do is that I'm going to give you my my you know I'm I'm, I'm going to make it as introductions rather than as data dump. Um, I'm going to this is a um, fairly light type of conversation rather than a hardcore presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, go over um, my education, where and where from and what, and then um, some employment history over the years. Um, then my teaching experience, which um, I love it, that I always wanted to get back to teaching even right from um, back home. And then uh, um, part of that 
teaching experience is that the corporation here at Xerox um, has encouraged, it doesn't encourage me only, but every, anybody else to get involved with the academic institutions. And I've been a key academic liaison with a number of universities. I'm gonna share that, that list with you guys. And then one thing which I have believed very strongly um, in the very early stages of my career, uh, the way to, to deliver on some of the, uh, the programs, the projects, the problem solving, um, uh, and it's called the, the concept of the open innovation. I'm just gonna introduce that uh, to you guys. And then uh, the follow on, um, I am, as Sarah uh, mentioned, uh, I've been a um, member of the, the National Academy of Engineering and the uh, inventors and uh, work very, have been working very closely with the NSF and lately with the, the Institute of um, uh, you know, uh, um, Engineering and Technology. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some, some real example of what I'm doing there. I have been involved also very actively with the New York State uh, government agencies. The first one with a nice start is a research um, technology the, uh, and, and research organization. The nice start is the, uh, the um, basically energy agency and Fuse Hub is a kind of, a, it's, a, a, it's a bond between the in past involvement, NYSTAR and NYSTAR, and I keep, I play a very key role in, 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 in there, have been playing key role in there and continue to do that. Uh, then I'm gonna get into the real business uh, of um, uh, you know, what I'm doing, why, what I have done um, and, and why specifically, and, and then what have been the main focus um, and as, as Sarah mentioned, intellectual property generation and management and its value to not only to um, Xerox Corporation, but also uh, in general, uh, why should anybody else care about the intellectual property that's not generated? Um, I have a, a very, I'm very proud uh, to, I'm gonna share my recommendations. I have a table. Uh, which both uh, the accolades which I've gotten from um, uh, internally from Xerox and from uh, outside and, and the, the membership and fellowship to the, the National Academies is a part of the external and, and I, that, I have that table. Um, then at the end, um, I'm going to share some insights into if when and if you are ready to move on either uh, after you graduate either to academic academia or to industry, um, uh, at least I can share my thoughts, what works or what has worked for me, and there may be some lessons to learn. Um, and, and especially if you have a innovation mindset where you want to take your ideas um, from your left hand to all the way to the customer hands, um, some of the, some of the, 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 the lessons which lessons learned and, and the, the paths I have followed. So uh, that'll be a pretty, uh, I have a one slide on it. And then if there is time left, then we'll uh, have some questions. Um, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, if we ran out of the time, um, then feel free to send me the questions um, and then I'll be glad to respond or even come back um, if need be to uh, continue having this conversation. Education. Uh, so one, so Santok, sorry to interrupt, but one logistical note for the students, if you do have questions, several of you have already posted on Piazza, but online, if you have questions, please post them on chat. So Santok uh, will try to get to them. And if not, as he mentioned, he's going to get to them afterward. Thank you. So education, uh, I um, always say that I'm overeducated. I have two bachelors one master's, two PhDs, one, one from India, one from UK, a postdoctoral fellowship in the in University of Leicester, UK. Um, why do I have two PhDs? Uh, when I came to UK, to the University of Anglia to do a postdoc, um, 
um, the professor um, basically said, hey, uh, the money is only for two years. And if you work hard, um, then you may be able to write the thesis for a PhD. So I was able to finish that PhD in roughly two years. So um, two PhDs in five years. Um, so um, that's the education background. The, um, the, the fact that I may, this is one thing a uh, little bit uh, interesting. I always liked physics um, because my teachers in, in my uh, grad school, uh, now early uh, college, they were uh, <clears throat> good teachers. Um, <clears throat> so um, I applied to um, the university for a then a, a, a bachelor's um, and um, but my scores were not good enough, not uh, you know high enough to get into physics. So um, the the dean basically said, "Hey, go over next door, and uh, you probably will get into chemistry." So I went there, paid the fees. Here you are. I'm a chemist rather than rather than physics. Um, there's no more thought about it. It's just that I couldn't get into physics uh, physics department. Teaching. Um, I got married uh, when I was in England, um, met a girl, married, and then um, once uh, I graduated, I had an offer to go back uh, where I, you know, in, in India as a social professor, but my bride said, no, I don't want to go there, and I said, I don't want to stay in, 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 in England. So it was a consensus that let's uh, find some place which is of uh, uh, you know beneficial to both of us. So applied for an uh, opening at RPI Tri New York. Came over there, taught chemistry for uh, almost four years, and then um, from there I joined Xerox Corporation in their Webster Research Center, uh, and I've been in R and D in, in in the center now almost four decades uh, and never regretted uh, making that transition. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been um, um, adjunct at, um, at Purdue uh, involved with that uh, professional master program. Um, I worked with Purdue even before that, uh, but th th this was a little bit formal. And then later last year, uh, I uh, accepted the position as a distinguished professor in the electrical engineering department. Uh, I have worked very closely with, uh, as I said before, in the, in the colleges. Uh, the, my, my favorite school is Clark's University. Uh, they asked me to come deliver a commencement address, gave me an honorary uh, doctor of science, and they also established a scholarship in my name it's called Santhak Asbadesha Leadership Scholarship. Um, it's not that Xerox is paying, they paid for it. It's uh, they are the one who actually um, uh, established a scholarship in my name. And they gave one, one student a year um, the scholarship. Um, so it's quite, a, quite an honor to have your name attached um, and your picture um, in the hallways over there. Um, the third bullet, the fourth bullet, technical uh, uh, liaison. Um, Xerox invests into the academic institutions. There have always been, I don't know why, 20, 22 academic institutions, and, and most of them are listed here. Uh, that number has stayed the same during the past 35 plus years. Uh, if you want to add another one, then you have to pick out one of the other one, the, the one on the list before. So I actually play either a technical or executive liaison role. I would say out of the 20, probably uh, 12, 13 of them. And some of them are mentioned over there. You can see that. And that also gives me an opportunity to actually work with the faculty. Um, and the second bullet down there from the bottom, uh, been a Four PI, PI, um, support the, the applications with the, the NSF. Um, 
and with quite a bit, you know, uh, amount of money um, I've been able to get with them. It's, it adds up to be almost, you know, well over four million dollars over the years. Um, so it's quite a um, quite interesting and very rewarding when it comes to um, to to leveraging the resources from outside. First thing is recognizing the resources. Then you leverage to actually solve your own problems, and it's a part of that uh, part of open innovation also. So I I actually take pride in learning from these academic institutions, use their learning to then articulate the solutions which we are struggling, which we have been struggling in the industry. So keep that in mind that, that, that keeping your eyes open on both sides of the aisle, um, it, it, would, it will benefit you tremendously. Um, appointments, again, um, you can start from the bottom, RPI, then join Xerox as a senior scientist, then became a principal. The dates are there, you can, you can um, read it leisurely, then became a manager of the, of the lab, promoted to a research fellow, then a corporate fellow, and then top two are the ones which I just talked about. So this is quite a journey and a um, um, lot of struggle. It's not, these things don't come easy, um, especially as you get beyond certain level. Um, these titles, the, the, they become a little bit restricted. But uh, um, I think I do have to recognize I've done well here um, in, in, in the company. Um, this slide uh, is since I got involved with the academies, um, I, I think I, we all, the people who are the members or fellows of these academies, uh, they will tell you from that, yes, these are honors, but it is a service to the community. So NAE, the National Academy of Engineering is also, is actually very, very particular about getting you involved with some of the things which, which, which they believe are needed and you can contribute. So I, I, uh, I think I get more than my share. Um, and I, I, I also believe that this is probably because I have a good mix of um, you know, academic excellence as well as a bulk of it is the, the more um, you know, the practical part working in the industry. So this, this knowledge um, helps and it helps me a, a, a great deal to make connections and get ideas. So the list is long. You can see the National Research Council. I, there is a fellowship program where the agencies actually advertise um, the fellowships. And then there's a committee which reviews those, those agency, for, for example, the NSF or DOE, DOD, DOE or NIST, and then then I'm a part of the, the committee which actually reviews those proposals and make recommendations. Who are, who should or should not be getting it. These agencies do their own filtration as well, but then I think we do the validation part of it. Uh, the second bullet, which is the member of the Committee on the Dean of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Um, this is, was a, this has been a three-year appointment. This is a formal appointment and I had to get all the permissions from internally here. Um, and you had to be vetted and, and you know, uh, security clearance and all that. The, 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 the job, the assignment basically is to actually look at these formal boards. For example, the, the, the board and energy and environment systems, manufacturing materials, the aerospace and infrastructure science assessment. Those are listed down there, you can see that. These boards actually come to the meeting and review their progress with us in front of the committee. And then we then, the committee members, advise the government on what did we learn, what that we didn't learn, and then that gets into the, their, 
national um, science and science, science and technology policy. It's a very um, time consuming, but from the learning point of view, you can't ask about an opportunity to get involved with this. Um, the, there are two meetings every year. Uh, they're both in DC. Actually, there's one upcoming in, um, in, at end of March. Um, so um, I'm in my second year. Um, no, actually it's a little over one year. Um, so, so that one is pretty time consuming, pretty rewarding. The next one is the, uh, the NSF tip directorate. Uh, he did, by the way, Sarab, he's coming. Uh, they, 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 we, we, we're making arrangements for Gyan Tandani to come. Uh, we are meeting tomorrow to make the plan. Uh, and um, I'm going to take you up on, you know, helping and, um, you know, do's and don'ts. And I, we want to take advantage of their visit. Sure. So I will, um, I'll, I'll connect you with that. It'll be great to get him uh, to come to Purdue and see all of the technology translation effects which are going on. Uh, actually, he's, a, he's been, uh, because of all the involvements with, which I have up there, um, he, um, I've been in his uh, good books, let's put it this way. So I asked him, I said, hey, Erwin, how about coming over here? And he responded, you know, right away. Um, so, uh, that, uh, so the arrangement is being made. So uh, I'll keep you posted. Um, the, the next one is, a, I'm also a, a proposal reviewer for this uh, NSF uh, PFI program. Uh, this is partnership for, for innovation. Uh, there is a, also a team um, which is actually involved, and the members are down there. You, know, you can see the, there are a number of CTOs. I'm there, two deans, um, yeah, Dean Casano and Bob Khan. And, and you can see the list down there. Um, um, we're going to, by the way, we're going to get, uh, um, we already have Malik come here give a talk. Uh, Dave Perello from uh, Dow also became, by the way, the NAE member in this fund. Uh, he's uh, scheduled to come give a talk. With Banerjee, he's the CTO of Anasis, he's also scheduled to come give a talk. So this is a good group, good connection. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna leverage this to, to, to bring some light, uh, what is needed out there um, and, and we should make a concerted effort to have the student body from whosoever can, should uh, attend these, these uh, presentations. Uh, the last one uh, is the reviewer for the fellowship application for the uh, IET. So this list, you can see, um, you can read it also at, at pleasure and any questions I can respond later on. Here is the, the, the New York State. Um, um, was a part of the, the new state governor actually had a very active ask, active, active proposal and a wanted ask from the industry and the academia saying that basically there's a lot of intellectual property sitting in the academia. And why is it that industry is not harvesting or leveraging that to create more jobs? So uh, obviously the phone call came to the, our CEO, that CEO calls uh, the CTO, CTO calls my manager. At the end, I was a volunteer to participate in that, uh, that, in that uh, uh, team. Um, number of proposals you can see, uh, each one of these is a, our presentation. I have formal, if any time later on, uh, we want to go through any one of those, I'd be glad to. The first, the first, and I'm the one who authored those white papers. So the first ask was define what needs to be done and have a consensus. Then there is a, another formal group, and I was a part of that, it's called Arman Group. So how do you then implement those ideas? if those are implementable. So uh, that, the second bull, big bullet is the NYSTAR NYSERDA. Um, I'm a kind of, um, 
have been in the past 20 plus years, a, a unpaid, uh, not paid um, consultant um, and of the need to the, these two agencies, which are the agency, which is energy and the science agency. So Carl was, oh, we have about $15 million. Uh, what is of interest to the industry in the New York? Um, and so I went, saw them, the team at Nasserda in Albany, and proposal was to let's get behind 3D printing because you know we are in the printing business. So I was I was a little selfish, um, and they basically said, go ahead, uh, put together the team, come back with the proposal, and um, we'll see what to do with it. Result of that is that the print center, the additive manufacturing print center at RIT, is a result of that. Um, and 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 the key industry partners were Xerox, of course, me, Clark, um, um, Corning, um, Eastman Kodak, Bosch Alam, GE. Uh, there were six, seven of them. Uh, Key, the, the, the major um, industry, and there were a number of small industries who were involved, uh, as well as the, the partner for this center has been the Clarkson RIT and Sony, Sony Mupals. So um, these centers, there are 15 in the New York State uh, under different focuses. This particular one, RIT AM Print Center, is led by Dennis Cormier, and it is on the additive manufacturing. So, um, and, and, and the state calls them centers of advanced technology. I think this model, um, Saurabh, I think we should probably have a little bit more conversation with the, the current president now, Mung, and or even, you know, um, go back to Daniels. Bring it up to the attention of the Indiana um, the, the government, at least share the learnings and see if they want to get behind one of these, you know, something like this, at least. Um, I, I firmly believe that it's okay to fail, but, you know, if you don't try, you're not going to, you're not going to learn and you're not going to, you're not going to get it. So um, in the future, I'm just putting some thoughts in your head. So Santok, there are several questions which have come in over Piazza as well as synchronously now. Uh, would you want to take a couple of those questions now, in which case I would read it out? Uh, yes, go ahead. So one of the questions which multiple students have asked is, what kinds of challenges have you faced when trying to get a patent? And how did you your patents improve the industry you were in? So... Um... When you are working on a, a, when you're working in an industry, for example, um, you know the, what the problem is. And, and then you also know that in, in, in large industry, that it's not only you who's going to be, be doing solving every problem, it's a team. Uh, which the, the which is formed normally by the management and the, the team leader and on and on, but you think about you you know right at the beginning when you, when you are when you think about a solution, let's say if it's a material solution, and I'll probably go through one of the examples later on, um, then you you know that that material requirement has to be defined. And if that material exists, then obviously you cannot patent it. But if it, if you need to modify that material, then you can actually file a patent on, um, on, on the material composition, just first the composition. Then you can also cover what is it for, application of it. So for example, in Xerox, will then try to cover in the Xerox field of use, we call it. Then there is intellectual property. You have to think about if there is anything, if you're scaling it, if this is something unique. Uh, and, and, and then also 
even the market which you're serving, if you are meeting some special needs of your customer, um, which are not met before. Um, so this chain of thinking through the thought process of what material, what is the application, how are you gonna make it? Is there anything in, in unique in making? And that chain starts and um, in a team, one of the, the, the things which is a absolute no-no is that you don't want to hold on to your own idea. If you hold on to your part that, and be afraid that somebody's gonna steal it, it's not gonna go anywhere. You need to learn, actually that's one of the lessons in, the, in my last slide. You need to learn to let go. Let the other people take the ownership and then um, be a part of that. If you look at my, um, the, the, the patents, which is now number is 263 issued patents and 50 plus now in the, in the pipeline, already filed uh, at U USPTO, you will see probably my name first on those on a very small percent. Um, because again, as I said, that if you if you hold on and you think that it's my idea and somebody's gonna steal it, um, that 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 doesn't work in a in a in a team environment. Then then somebody will put a block on it and and it won't go anywhere. Did did I answer that question? The the answer or um, yeah, thank you. I think that was a great answer. Um, I'll take a second question and then we can move on with your slides again. So the second question is looking at your return to academia after such a successful career in industry. And you mentioned earlier on that you love teaching. So this question is asking, what about teaching do you enjoy the most? And what do you think has been a biggest difference in graduate education from the over the last uh, however many years that you have seen this? So the, the, the te teaching part of it, um, the confession is that, that I have spent my 40 plus years in applied research here at, at, and, 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 and at Xerox, one place, very comfortable. Um, uh, probably would have, you know, just, just put a uh, retiree hat and, and move on. Um, what do I, I, I enjoy teaching is actually the skill set which are the skill set which are needed in a in an industry environment. Um, we call them soft skills, for example. Um, that 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 what works, what doesn't work in in, in the industry environment. How do you appreciate? For example, um, the diversity, and I don't mean to, uh, you know, the diversity of the, the, the race and, and gender and all that, that's a given, everybody. Uh, but the diversity of um, the skill set, which is needed if you want to take your ideas from the test tube all the way to the customer hands, your ability to actually acknowledge and leverage the diversity of skill is something which is a topic by itself. Um, and, and I love to do that. The other one, which is on a later slide, is the, your ability to, um, this may sound critical, um, uh, work across the aisles. You know, every politician, when they need your vote, they say that, oh, I'm good at doing it. But what I mean here is that your ability to actually have this, this relationship you can build, and these are not ad hoc relationships, these are strategic partnerships you are able to build um, with, the, with the, uh, the, the bridge between the academia and the industry. Because they both need each other. You need to connect industry, university, um, partnership um, to actually make something out of it. Innovation, then feedback, what kind of skill sets are needed for the workforce of the future. 
So that is again, is a topic by yourself, a lot of writings on it. Um, that, so I call them, you know, uh, boundary spanners. Um, actually, I was a part of a study with the North Carolina State um, University and CSU at Raleigh. Uh, we got a $800,000 um, grant from uh, NSF to actually spearhead that study, what are the attributes of a boundary spanner? Um, and I have a, a paper on it. If um, anybody wants to, I can, I can show that. So that also talks about what kind of attributes are needed uh, in teaching. Um, uh, so, 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 so that's another one. Um, there, are, there, are, there are other, your, your ability to actually recognize the, the follow up on the first question, um, intellectual property. Um, do, if, you, if you attend some of these courses from traditional courses on <clears throat> what is a patent and, and, and what is trade secret on and on, those are basically the tank talks. You can, you can read those on, on, on Google. Um, but as the quest, first question was, what does it take? What, what, what are the insights into getting intellectual property and then, and then expanding that to make something out of it so that uh, you can leverage, you can um, make money, um, you can bargain you know, back and forth with, with other people. So that's, that's another, um, and, and the last one I would say, uh, the, the whole concept of uh, open innovation, that if you are going, if you're gonna solve a problem, whether it's, it's in the academia or in, in um, industry, don't try to do it yourself. Look around, look around who can help you. And then, partner, so use your resources and, and, and your uh, other partners' resources also, and then share as you mature them and then play into the, on the, on the other side of the funnel, um, into the markets of uh, both sides. So, and, and again, there are books on open innovation and I have given talks at UC Berkeley because my friend over there, Henry Chesbro, he's the one who came up with the open innovation concept. Um, so, so I think those are the key ones um, which, which, which enjoy teaching. Of course, I'm a, I'm a scientist you know, also by training, by education. So if need be, uh, that's also the fair game. Thank you, Santo. We can continue with your presentation. Okay, so uh, I think I'll, I'll have to go a little faster now. So here's the, the Henry's funnel, by the way. Um, basically, it says that when you are, can you see my uh, mouse moving? Okay, if not, that's okay. So you see that funnel. Um, the, the major message is that if you follow this, and, and I have followed all my career, when I want to work on something, I don't try to do everything myself or whatever is available to me given by the corporation. I always go out. I always um, work with um, other industry partners, work with other academic institutions, uh, fill the front end of the, of the funnel, share the knowledge back and forth, and then, then solve our problems. And, and the, the arrows on the, on, the, on, the, on the left side, it basically shows you, it helps you, it, it de-risks, you spend less money because you are, you know, and, and, and less time um, and you can do other things. Uh, and then also, you know, hiring back and forth. This is a very, very effective tool. Um, it, it sounds, you know, obvious, but try to do that. It, it's, uh, there's IP issues involved. There are, uh, you know, different managements, but I have never over the past 40 plus years faced any of the values. Uh, actually benefited both the partners and Xerox benefited on this one. Okay, quickly some lessons on um, uh, my real work, what I have done actually at, at, at Xerox. Um, 
we make very simple printing presses. All you do is press on a green button and then uh, here comes a nice, uh, a warm, um, you know, full color um, a print. Uh, key, uh, uh, you know, the modules, you generate the image. That's what when you press the button, you see the light, uh, flashlight, and then some, you know, roar, um, toner comes in and, and then, you know, put the image onto there, we created the image, then fuse fix and all that. The cartoon on the right side top, uh, paper jamming, that's just for fun, uh, because you don't want to, when you are trying to make these prints on these presses, uh, these are very expensive presses, uh, you don't have paper jam and then you, know, you have to stop your, so um, a lot of effort in actually making energy efficient, less jammed, cheaper, better, faster, um, um, which, which goes on. And in the middle, you see the, the toner path, basically starting from that green button all the way to uh, what you see out there. These are, by the way, uh, I'm making it very simple uh, just for conversation, but these are very complex systems. Um, and, and no wonder that you need a broad spectrum of scientific engineering skills and the infrastructure, you need the money and all that to, to make these presses. Um, so this cartoon on the on the, the left side top is the same one. Uh, people also use the inkjet. Basically, you have a print head, and you're squirting dropwise um, digital digital way ink onto a, a media, meaning paper, and then you dry it if it's a water based ink. The the, the cartoon down there is a we. We are the one who um, spearheaded this one, solid ink, this is, which is a waxy ink. Basically, you are now squirting the, the images onto a moving drum, which is heated and it has the, um, it is a, 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 a fluid layer on it. You bring it back and then you press down and heat. Uh, that's the transfix roller. Um, we um, bought this technology from Tektronix um, and then uh, uh, you know, commercialized it. Um, but we are sort of de-emphasizing. The reason is that these vaccine inks, um, prints are beautiful, color prints, four color prints, but um, image performance is a problem. You can scratch with your thumbnail and, and um, the cotton on the bottom left is a different uh, uh, technology, um, which was actually um, um, kind of um, matured by Fuji Xerox, our Fuji Xerox. We focus on the top one, top left, where the green button is, which is, we call it a image on image. And the bottom one is basically, uh, we image onto uh, a belt and then, then move the image around. Um, these presses, as I said, um, are very, very complex. Look at this iGen. Um, it is almost, I think, 40 feet in length. And look at the how complex, you know, even the wires alone in this one machine is three, four, no, three and a half miles of wires. And look at the microprocessors, motors, and, and all that. These, by the way, sell very close to a million dollars. And um, there's one uh, on the Purdue site, there's Xerox, by the way, if you don't know, uh, Xerox does all produce printing. So this iGen machine is on the, on the campus. Um, that's where you get your color prints. Um, so a time, Santok, uh, a time check. We are about two minutes away from the end of the class. Okay, so I'm gonna then just, just skip some other. So this is the uh, other one. This is the April sync jet machine, similar story. Um, and I'm going to, let's see, go further. Okay. Um, I think I mentioned that before. Um, been very um, productive, um, 263 patterns. 
Um, this is the number of mentioned disclosures over the years. Um, just one comment about the, the, the patterns. Um, of course, the high number matters, you know, because you can use to either monetize it or in litigation, you can say, my bucket is bigger than yours. So, so compromise. But what is important is how much, how many of those basic pat patterns are being used to in, in, in the products, how much money the, the, the uh, company is making. In my case, uh, it is documented by, by the management team here that on, on the average, from my inventions, um, companies have been making hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And you can add those numbers in tens and tens of billions of dollars over the years since that joins up. Uh, it is recognized. Um, that's why I do get a lot of um, accolades from uh, internally. Um, this is just a list of uh, the, the areas where I have commercialized the intellectual property. Um, one comment again on this is one thing to have a key patent, but you want to make sure that you also have surround patents so that nobody else can get in. Um, so, um, for example, if I say there are 58 patents in the fusing, not all 58 is being used, but it will be probably six different types being used, but the rest of them are surrounds. And you need to do that if you, if you, if you want to protect your, your, your business. It's, that's very important. Um, this is a quote from uh, one of my uh, um, former Charlie Duke. Charlie, by the way, uh, was um, a, a member of the both academies, uh, NAE and NAS. He was also a chief editor of the surface science. I worked for him and this is what his uh, quote I just want to share. Um, he did some calculations and based on that, I got the present award from uh, you know. Here is a list of uh, my internal um, and external awards. Uh, I have- So Santok, I think uh, unfortunately we've run out of time. This has been a fantastic session. Let me uh, end by asking one somewhat uh, very thought provoking question that was asked by one of the students, Tanuj. Okay. So Tanoj asked the question that um, given that you've had this long career in the corporate world, looking back, is there anything you feel you should have done differently in your career and something that he or probably others as a newcomer in the industry should keep in mind? I, I, I think um, one thing, no regrets. You know, I, I have enjoyed working uh, for Xerox. It's a great place. But you also become a little um, comfortable. And uh, if I have to do it again, I will probably um, move every 10 years to a different, to acquire a different set of skills. Um, um, maybe a different industry. Um, um, but that's not an active comment to the life at Xerox. But it's just that if you if you look at 40 years ago when I started my career, uh, we had those uh, typewriters, right? Um, but look at now how the communications are. Um, you, you see every the the you know people they have these terms, you know, palms in their hand. So um, yeah, um, I would I would probably um, um, move on to um, stepwise, acquire more skills and, and, and have the career advancement. Got it. Thank you, Santok. On that note, uh, let's thank Santok. And thank let's you. draw this session to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, it was a good talk. Yeah, it was a good talk.